Thank you so much, David. It is, it's wonderful to be back here again. This is the first year that we've done two Lynn Lathan gatherings in one season. We had one in May and another in August. And for those of you who are old timers, you know that we used to gather in Elmont and we're getting a little big for that space. And it's wonderful to be here in Carleton Place, which is a little closer to the farm where we hold the weekend retreat that's always associated with this weekend. So it makes it easy for the team to come and set up. And it's, it's a wonderful space to be in. Um, we're really enjoying getting to know David and this space better um, and to be guests here and to participate in your acknowledgement, which means a lot to the team. We, we talk, we're still talking about the acknowledgement last May. Um, yeah, I think for, especially for those of you who are in the university world, um, sometimes acknowledgements get trotted out in trite ways and unthought out ways. And that's something that we want to invite in our gathering in Lothan to think about our words, to think about our relationships, to mean what we say and say what we mean and delve into that deeper. And we appreciate Zion's intentionality around that. Um, I want to echo David's thanks to you guys for being brave, for coming out despite all those bleepings and blarings on your phone. And actually, as I say that, I'm kind of making myself think, maybe, I, I don't even know if the tornado warnings go off if we're still in airplane mode. But regardless of that, if, you know, reminder to switch your phones to airplane mode, if, if you will, just so that we don't interrupt the speakers when they're in full mode. It's wonderful to see familiar faces. It's wonderful to see new faces. And I love listening at the beginning when people are coming into a Lynn Lathan gathering and at the end, again and again, every year this happens. Oh, you're here? Oh, I haven't seen you in ages. Oh, you know that person? And it's so much fun to watch them. Let me introduce you to so-and-so. And I love how that happens at each of these gatherings. And it's already begun tonight. Um, yeah, it, yeah, there's people here tonight that I haven't seen for well over 20 years myself, and it's, it's very fun. Now, those of you who are returnees also know that I'm a text person. I don't speak well off, off of the, without a page, and so I'm going to turn to my page now. In the early 19th century, a Scottish lawyer made an unusual decision. Forced to give up his Edinburgh practice to attend to responsibilities on his family estate, a place that was called Lynn Lathan, he decided to turn that family home into a refuge that combined learning, dialogue, community, and hospitality. The people who began to gather in his house and community were diverse in worldviews, in theological perspectives, in life experiences, and vocation. But archived letters, which I've had the chance to read, from those people, people as varied as Thomas Carlyle and George MacDonald, show how welcoming and restful and fun those gatherings were. Two centuries on, here in the Ottawa Valley, we hope that our own Lynn Lathan events can create a similar space. Thomas Erskine, Erskine of Lynn Lathan as he was known, was well-schooled in theology, philosophy, the arts, and literature. A seasoned traveler, he cultivated many literary and personal relationships, both in London and on the European continent. But he was also deeply committed to his own rural community. His delight in his own heritage had increased rather than inhibited his delight in the culture of others. And I think I like to repeat that because I think it's such an important concept. Erskine's delight in his own heritage, his knowledge of his own heritage, increased rather than inhibited his delight in the culture of others. Erskine's understandings of parish, the concept of parish, and of education were modeled upon those of his friend Thomas Chalmers. Now, many of you, I'm sure, know of Chalmers churches scattered throughout, I was going to say throughout Ontario, but throughout Canada. Um, I know in Ottawa there's a Chalmers church. There's churches in, Chalmers churches in cities and small towns all around this country. They are always either Presbyterian or United Churches that were previously Presbyterian churches. And they're named after this man, Thomas Chalmers. Chalmers and his friend Thomas Erskine understood through their study of scripture that theology must first and foremost be relational. Otherwise, it's not theology. 
Stewarding stories and remembering well was an integral part of that relationality, and doing so in their place, in their home. That's really important to both of them, even using the language of their home, the Scottish dialect of their home. They also both believe that we as humans are called to be attentive to and in right relationship with all of the creation of the Creator, not only fellow humans. Tonight, Shalise Stearns and Erica Grimm, as the 2023 Summerlin Lathan speakers, are going to help us step into new considerations of such a perspective. It's a delight to me that they have both, they have both traveled from the West Coast, Shalise from Seattle and Erica from the Lower Mainland BC, to challenge us Ontarioans to dive deeper into the epiphanies evoked by both the, con by both the concepts and the very beings of watershed. I'm privileged to have known both of these artist scholars for a rather long time. I'm learning as you get older, time does funny things. It doesn't seem possible that I have known them both this long. Shalee and I overlapped years at Regent College in Vancouver, and then we were both doctoral students together at the same time in St. Andrews, Scotland. Having begun a year before me, Shalee can boast of being in the very first year of students at the Institute of Theology, the Arts, and the Imagination that was founded by Trevor Hart and Jeremy Begbie. Some of you will remember Trevor as our speaker for Lynn Lath in 2015. And Shalee was Begsby's first music and theology PhD student, which I think is a little feather in Jeremy's cap <laughs> to have had Shalee. Erica and I attended the same church in Vancouver way back in the early 90s when she was already a Regent alumna. My brother had her son in his Sunday school class. Um, in which I think he mostly just read George MacDonald's The Princess and the Goblin. Um, I also had the privilege to write a short piece in one of Erica's artworks in the early 2000s for Artway. It's so fun and an honor to have these friends both here today and to share them with you guys. Shalee has an undergrad degree in music, a master's in theology and the arts, and a PhD in constructive theology. She's a frequent visiting faculty at Regent College. She has just concluded a 15-year 15 15 year professorship at the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. Her academic work is focused on theology and the arts, as well as on how thinking through the lens of trauma shifts our perspectives on reconciliation and redemption. Recent publications have included a book on musical space, unity, and Trinitarian theology called Handling Dissonance, a musical theological aesthetic of unity. Shalee has contributed several book chapters and essays on lament in the works of composer James McMillan, Trauma and Christology, A Musical Theology of Trauma, and Music and Prayer. She is also, as you will hear tonight, an accomplished violinist. Shalee has a rich background both in teaching violin and in performing in chamber and orchestral settings. And she got definite extra kudos from some of my friends for appearing in the video playing along with Sleeping at Last, for those of you who know Sleeping at Last. She has many years of experience of serving in churches as a musician, teacher, and worship leader, a deeply interdisciplinary theologian and musician. She is passionate about exploring the Christian imagination, and within that, how Trinitarian theology can enrich spiritual practice in life. Erica's undergrad was in fine arts at the University of Regina. She grew up a prairie girl, like at least one other person in this room. And before her master's at Regent, she studied with Gerhard Winner in Germany. Um, her PhD at Simon Fraser in BC was called The Aesthetics of Attentiveness, a Philosophy for Artists and Educators. And like Shalee, Erica both practices and teaches art. She's currently a senior professor at Trinity Western University in BC and she was for some time also the head of the art department there. Erica's material practice explores the entangled connections between embodiment and ecology. The first work of Erica's I ever saw was her Day of Creation series, uh, which hung outside the faculty offices at Regent. Her recent research creation has been collaborative large-scale installations and walking projects fueled by environmental urgency and concern. Attentiveness is key to what Erica creates and to how she lives. Her work often includes scientific texts, maps, medical imagery, and sound. She has been awarded the 2002 Distinguished Nash Lecturer. She's received the Imago National Juried Art Prize, 
and was appointed University of Regina Distinguished Alumni. Her work is widely exhibited in museum, public, and community galleries, and is found in collections such as the Canada Council Art Bank, the Richmond Art Gallery, and the Vatican Collective of Contemporary Art. Erica's written practice considers the epistemological implications of the process of making, and her forthcoming book is titled, after her dissertation, The Aesthetics of Attentiveness. That word is gonna be key. Erica is also, like Shali, a deeply interdisciplinary theologian and artist, and is likewise passionate about exploring the Christian imagination and how relational theology enriches and unveils the wonder of creation. Perhaps the greatest delight in introducing you all to these my funny, fascinating, long-term friends is that you will get to see the beauty of relationality in action. Shalee and Erica met for the very first time this summer, and only once before they arrived here. And already, in bringing together their passions and exploring their differences and similarities, in listening to each other, in teaching each other, they are painting entirely new and exciting and challenging vistas into which now they will invite us all. Thank you both. I think we can all go home now, so. Uh, no, just, um, just so you know, I'm Shalee, and this is Erica. Uh, uh, we wanted to start with land acknowledgements as well and include water. And in the first part of, of the talk tonight, we want to invite you into something of a liturgy, kind of a contemplation. We have a lot of, in some ways, facts and figures and things to talk about that are really in some ways difficult, but at the same time, we want to invite you into a place of prayer, of meditation, wherever your own spirituality kind of takes you in the midst of this. There'll be a little bit of music, please do not clap. Um, this is just meant to kind of give us a little bit of space to kind of go, where does this take us? And then the second half, we'll kind of enter into some other materials, so. We're just going to begin with our own land acknowledgements, going a little bit deeper. So I want to start with the land acknowledgement from where I was born and where I was raised. Um, I was raised in the Rogue River Valley in Southern Oregon in the United States. And when I looked for official land acknowledgements, I couldn't find any. This is a very hidden history, and I never heard about this at school. We never talked about the history of the native population in Southern Oregon at all. So I wrote my own acknowledgement. So I would like to acknowledge that I was born and raised on the unceded and ancient lands of the Degelma people who were targeted for extermination during the Rogue River War of 1855 to 56. The survivors of this war represent Oregon's Trail of Tears and were forced on fo foot to a reservation in Northern Oregon. Today, only seven mem 70 members of the Degelma people remain, but 200 years ago, there were over 10,000 people in the same region. Today, they are recognized as members of the Confederated Tribes of Silitz Indians, a confederation of the many native peoples of Western Oregon, but have little recognition or rights on their own. In fact, they cannot forage or even hunt on their own grounds. Where I live in Seattle, I would like to acknowledge that I live on the traditional and unceded lands of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, past and present, and honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tri tribe. Among the Duwamish are the direct descendants of Chief Seattle, who both signed the Treaty of Point Elliot in January 1855 and expressed his hopes and purposes for signing over the land of his people and their ancestors. Chief Seattle questioned in his famous speech if such treaties were even reasonable. He began, how can you buy or sell the sky, the warmth of the land? The idea is strange to us. If we do not own the freshness of the air and the sparkle of the water, how can you buy them? <clears throat> 
And I would like to acknowledge that I come from a stunningly beautiful flat prairie plain where the wind is always blowing, the grassland ecozone of a Treaty 4 territory that has been cared for since time immemorial by the Nakawe, Nehoawek, and Nakota people, later the homeland of the Métis, Lakota, and Dakota. Raised in a suburb in Regina, Saskatchewan, in Canada's interior plain, as you all know, I was born to second and third generation Polish, German, and Irish settlers and educated by the Jesuits at Campion College, a foundation that was profoundly spiritual, um, rigorously intellectual, justice-oriented, and world-affirming. Daily, I try and live up to it. But I also grew up nearly oblivious to the land on which I was situated. Distanced from nature, and like most children of a mechanistic worldview, dismissive of sensory perception. Entirely ignorant of the peoples whose history and culture predated my own an ancestors. Now, I am learning that what I thought I knew about the history of Canada is false. I acknowledge that now I live on the traditional, ancestral, unseated territory of the Stalo Tamuk. Tamuk means land, so Stalo means people of the river. On the shared territories of the Samath, Matsqui, and Le Chamel people who have cared for this land since time immemorial. Tamiuk, incidentally, is the Helkamalum word for our umbilical-like cord to the land and its live connection between seven generations past and seven generations into the future. This graphite drawing that you see, you see an excerpt of it that we could put up in the back of the church, that's like a detail of the, of, of the watercolor. You see the whole one here. This graphite drawing maps the circulatory system of the lower Fraser River watershed. Red marks its lost streams. And that big red shape is a lost lake, Lake Sumas. <clears throat> the green marks the high water mark of a 1.8 degree world. And I live here, right here, on um, near the Salish Sea, so here's the ocean, the Salish Sea, south of the Fraser, and right here, near the Wheelband watershed that I walk along daily. And so incidentally, this big red, red shape right here, that's the Sumas Lake that I'm sure you heard about, that while this piece was up at, at in the museum that it was being exhibited in, that's when we had the atmospheric river and that lake refilled. That was the lake that refilled and shut down the highway and shut down access of BC to all of Canada. Watersheds literally are drainage basins for water and gathering grounds immediately between rivers. Watersheds, used figuratively, refer to crucial periods or turning points. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary, however, also adds a medical meaning 
referring to the shared tissue between two arterial systems that meet, often in the brain, often in the heart. That's where strokes appear usually. It's a very crucial meeting ground. Well, today, acknowledging today in Canada, we find ourselves in a nation on the cusp of two shattering and related reorientations, two watershed moments. The reckoning we face regarding our entwined, interrelated relationships with the land and with First Peoples is the most pressing, important, critical issue of our time. A turning point, a water parting, a gathering ground, and medically urgent. A watershed moment happened for me reading James Daschuk's devastating work. I grew up ignorant that Canada had literally cleared those beautiful prairie plains for my ancestors to inhabit. I grew up ignorant that Canada had literally cleared those plains that my ancestors arrived at and that I grew up on. James Sinclair's foreword summarizes James Daschuk's sobering text. Canada cleared the plains coldly, opportunistically, taking advantage of a famine caused by the exploitation of bison populations and the flooding of this territory by settlers. Methodically, Canadian leaders coerced First Nation leaders to signing treaties and drove their peoples onto reserves, establishing the circumstances and conditions in which Indigenous communities would be controlled and exterminated, physically and ideologically, from the national consciousness. In other words, Canada forcibly and willfully manipulated, removed, and murdered Indigenous peoples on the plains in the name of progress, literally clearing it for settlement. In countries of the world, this is called ethnic cleansing, extermination, and genocide. In Canada, this was called progress. None of this is an overstatement, James Sinclair says. It is all there in Daschuk's research, end quote. So James Daschuk's book tells a new history of Canada, a health catastrophe of such magnitude as to crack the very foundations of Canadian history as we once knew it. So Regina's nickname was Pile of Bones, and big piles of buffalo bones, you know, we grew up with, you know, seeing cartoons of it, but indeed the piles of buffalo bones were not made by the indigenous peoples. Those piles were made by the Hudson's Bay Company, who decimated the buffalo to fuel their company. The bones were sent to England to make bone china. I also grew up with my grandmother's bone china. Um, the bones were sent to England to make the bone china. And the hides were also sent to tanneries in England. And the meat was often left to rot. So this is the um, Wascana watershed, upper part of the upper Quapel watershed. And there's Regina, the site of many of those piles of bones. I also grew up in, in Regina, ignorant of the spiritual traditions of the Lakota and Dakota people who were profoundly connected to the land, the water and the watershed. They considered the buffalo sacred, a relation. The Hudson Bay Company considered the buffalo a free resource. The thirst dance, often referred to as a medicine dance, for example, connects the tree of life with the water of life. The very image of the Book of Revelation at the end of the Book of Revelation. Many of their sacred water rituals echoed my own growing up in the Catholic Church. And so this first watershed moment is the realization that a false myth underlies can Canadian identity. And Michelle Good has just published her book entitled Truth Telling, and it exposes in detail the false myths under or regarding Indigenous life underlying Canadian history and the human cost of colonialism, showing how it continues to underpin modern social institutions in Canada. Of course, the 2015 Truth and Reconciliation Commission started the slow, hard work of redressing the legacy of residential schools, but it was the discovery of 200 unmarked graves into Kamloops de Shikwepnuk in Kamloops um, on the site of the former um, Indian residential school there that shook many Canadians, deepening the reckoning of national self-identity. Historians estimate as many as 100 million 
indigenous people populated the Americas prior to European colonization. That's a staggering number, 100 million people. So it wasn't only on the plains. The Truth and Reconciliation, 94 Calls to Actions, James' work, Clearing the Plains, Michelle's work, Truth Telling, and of course Thomas King's and work, The Inconvenient Indian, and, and a host of other um, books are all must-reads for us as Canadians. And one of the consequences of such kind of forgiving, forgetting of language or forgetting of these relationships is um, seen in our current watersheds. And this is part of the theme of tonight. And so I wanted to introduce a particular study for, from the, C the city of Seattle and talk about occlusion. I'm just curious, who even knows what the word occlusion means? Is there a doctor? Yeah, there's people who, you know, yeah. Occlusion is one of those things. It's a medical term, similar to the medical definition of watershed that we see up there. But occlusion is, is a, actually a blocking of something. And this is exactly the way um, watersheds began to actually die because of occlusions that happened. Um, so I want to talk about the Duwamish River that runs through the south part of Seattle. I ta was talking to a friend the other day, and I said, so do you know the name of the river that's over there? Do you even know that that's a river over there? And they had no idea what the name of the river was or that it was even a river. All that we know in Seattle is that it's, an in, in, uh, it, it's a much more industrial uh, waterway. So along the side of the, of the Duwamish are factories, um, Name your industrial thing, and it's there. Um, so I'm going to talk about that a little bit. So what happened with this particular, even before there was industrialization that came to the Pacific Northwest, you have um, logging that was happening and farming and the re-engineering of different waterways. And in the process, one of the major things that happened was that the watershed was occluded. So we can go back, actually go to here. Um, so B.J. Cummings wrote this book called The River That Made Seattle because she, as an advocate, was realizing that hardly anyone even knew that there was a river there, for one thing, and we definitely didn't know the history of the river. So she wrote the book that tells the story of the river, its watershed, and the people who depended upon the ecosystem. Um, and I should say that, of course, the Duwamish is named after the tribal people that were there on the land at the time. So she discusses how even the earliest industrial uses of the river um, began to block different um, pathways to different rivers and actually started uh, blocking different rivers to the, mo to the point where the Black River no longer exists, parts of the White River no longer exist, the Cedar River no longer exists. So. This lack of attention to the health of the entire 200 square miles of watershed systems transformed, rerouted, and even drained the system. And she says that only 70 years after the first colonists settled on the Duwamish River, its watershed had been reduced to less than one quarter of its original size of more than 2,000 square miles, and only the waters of the Green River still flowed freely to the Duwamish. The white, black, and cedar rivers had been divor divi diverted to bypass the Duwamish and had dried up entirely. The waters of the freshwater lakes that these rivers fed and drained were forced through new newly engineered routes. So here is the, get, we'll do a little bit of map action here. So here's the original watershed of the Duwamish River. And by the early 20th century, we saw an actual occlusion or a severance of the, of the watershed that actually runs into Seattle. And so today, all that we see is this small kind of region that runs this. So this small region now um, supplies the city of Seattle for, with all of its water. And I just kind of like, you go back to this. From this to this in about 70 years. The second major thing that happened was the straightening of the river. So here's a mock-up 
on this side from the mid 1800s and you can see all the serpentining of the river that's the sign of a healthy river but in the beginning of the 20th century they began dredging the Duwamish River and um, within a few years the impact was known. This is B.J. Cummings again. In 1913, dredgers began to straighten the river's bends and deepen its draft for easy access by ships. The land board bordering this new channel was leveled and filled as a site for factories in an effort to create a modern industrial city. By the time the valley filled with the noisy bustle of commerce and industry, less than 2%, I'll say that again, less than 2% of the river's original habitat remained, pushing local salmon runs and wildlife close to extinction. So you can see here in the 1800s, a, a very fertile um, mud, mud flap, and that's where the indigenous people lived, and that's where the first settlers came and lived. And you can see now that there is no mud flap at all, or mud flat, not flap. Um, so it's kind of a, a striking example. So I just want to talk before I give things back over to Erica about one of her pieces of art, and this is called Become Animate. And I'm going to talk in more detail about this, but I found that this was much of the inspiration for this evening, because I find in Erica's art this idea that the very things that run through our bodies are, ha are the things that run through the ecology. So what's healthy within our bodies is healthy within the ecology or the ecosystem. And you can kind of see, like, it looks like tree roots running into the body that's in the middle, and then it looks like watersheds kind of coming out of that body. So Erica shows how the same patterns of watersheds run through our bodies in the roots of trees within our own brains and in the water systems of our world. Which brings us to the second related watershed moment with the Earth itself. The planet is warming at an unprecedented rate, unparalleled at any time in the past two millennia and without natural cause. Every UN climate change conference, of course we all know, reports that averting cat catastrophic consequences will require massive global change in the next decade, net zero by two 2050. Thomas Berry said that this was, that this, in, in the 1970s he said this, is the most significant reorientation our species has ever had to negotiate, has ever had to face. A reorientation that poet Tim Lilburn suggests we lack the interior imaginative capacity to navigate. The sixth mass extinction is coming to slowly yet too quickly, that's Catherine Keller's condensation, to actually act at a time when modernity has left large parts of the population distanced from nature and suspicious of their senses. Descartes' belief that nature could be harnessed is deeply at odds with what we experience today, waking up in the Anthropocene. In this, and this is Catherine Keller, in the odd, slow, fast time of climate change, action seems suspended. Collectively, we have woken up in the Anthropocene, and I'm sure you all know a term that marks how in 200 years, human activity has changed the chemistry of the planet. The Industrial Revolution, fueled by a mechanistic view of the universe, has inaugurated a systems change that threatens to end the fecundity of the Cenozoic era and head us in the direction of the sixth mass extinction. Understanding the implications of being a planetary geophysical force requires change. A radical reimagination of our entire place in the whole scheme of things. Like large parts of the population, I grew up distanced from nature and dismissive of sensory perception. I experienced these byproducts of modernity as inevitable. Most of us grew up believing in the hopeful narratives or the myths that surrounded a mechanistic worldview 
inaugurated by the Enlightenment that nature could be harnessed. Also in the particularly Canadian colonial myth of progress, our civilizing national project. A, and a great deal is much better than pre-Enlightenment days. Healthcare, for example. But as James Dashunk tells us, um, the health catastrophe that the indigenous people experience today means that the health benefits that we enjoy are not shared by everyone. We have known the science since 1853. COVID was our wake-up call that demonstrated human embedded embeddedness within Earth systems. Charles Taylor and others like Ian McGilchrist outlined in detail the flaws of an exclusively mechanistic worldview. So vastly different timescales circumscribe weather and climate, of course. Weather is immediate, experienced, short-term, now, minute to minute, one place, one time. Climate, long-term averages, what we expect in, say, 25 years. It measures averages of water, temperature, and wind across comparatively vast sweeps of time and space. But now, even our flawed perceptual apparatus, our bodies, can feel the change. The time scales are flattened as the global average temperature soar. A planetary system's change is afoot, and nearly no one will venture a guess at what things will be like too many years ahead. Change is literally in the air. That collectively people are waking up to this reality means it is a watershed moment. And we feel the change, and we hear about it. Every day we experience it extreme weather events today, <laughs> habitat devastation, biodiversity loss, pandemic, upended economic uncertainty. As we were preparing for this lecture, Typhoon Duxuri filled subways in the, in the Philippines, decimated Taiwan, and China had four inches of rain Saturday. That's a lot of rain in one day. These past years, in Abbotsford, the thermometer reached 48 degrees Celsius, lit and burned, an atmospheric brought back the Sumas Lake and revealed the limits of our civic infrastructure. On every continent, wild weather escalates, pushing past the carefully conservative scientific predictions around our changing planet, planet a global systems change. So given this, how then is making art a necessity, as Martha Nussbaum, Nussbaum asserts? Making music or making art? As James Sinclair reminds us, change begins with the narratives we tell ourselves. Underlying narratives, metaphors, frames, call it what you will, these are powerful aspects of our collective life together. Metaphors create social cohesion and catalyze action. The arts, of course, play a huge role in the metaphoring of any society. But artists do not so much create those metaphors, but they are alert to the charged, charged metaphors that are emerging. And in this watershed moment, the future is uncertain, and our society is not at all cool with any kind of uncertainty. Uncertainty goes against the narrative. The philosopher Edgar Morin taught, reminds us that it is uncertainty that is intrinsic to the human condition, and given the degradation of the Earth's biosphere, we need to prepare for disasters, he tells us. And unless we meet the IPC target, incidents of extreme weather, vector-borne infectious disease will increase, making these past few years a warm-up act for the years ahead. Despite our very human expectations of certainty, it is uncertainty 
that we need to cultivate a tolerance for. Uncertainty creates a pause, and in that pause is potential for something new to occur and for hope. For Rebecca Solnit, uncertainty is a precondition for change and for hope. Philosopher David Applebaum, too, maintains that unless what has come before is stopped, nothing new will arise. And from both Solnit and Applebaum is the invitation to not fear in times of being stopped. COVID stopped us. And amongst the horrors, a lot was revealed that needed changing. However, remember also that even large structures that seemed intractable suddenly changed. Change is possible. And the arts can be catalyst for change and for hope. For Aristotle, the primary function of the arts within any society is catharsis. So as you all know, catharsis is a purification uh, or purgation of the emotions, primarily through art, clearing out the trauma. Indigenous people speak of art as potent medicine. And of course, art therapy is, is, very, is, is very common right now. Sean McNiff is, uh, says that practices how activating the imagination can heal the mind. And even medical schools are now looking for studio practitioners, artists, um, in their, in their adding the visual arts into their curriculum uh, so they can turn out more accomplished physicians. They observe more carefully. Psychologically, we know that suffering must be externalized. Whoops. Suffering must be externalized for it to be used in a healthy manner and not destroy. And that goes for individuals as well as for societies. Of course, Rene Girard's seminal work also makes this connection and points to the necessary work of religion to create ritual and context for tensions within society to be purged. Action is the prescription for solastalgia, but without being grounded in mindful contemplative attention and nonviolence, our best efforts are ineffective and we burn out. Nicholas Walterstorff has long um, talked about the arts as necessary for a life of shalom. And of course, etymologically, the words whole, healed, and holy come from the same root, and the arts are integral for this healing whole and holiness to be manifested, this life of shalom to be manifested. I want to turn to a little bit of trauma theory as we kind of talk about this. And this might be a moment when I, if you were my students at, at my school, I would say, not to kind of relieve the tension in some ways as we talk about these things, but so that you can actually get oxygen to your brain and take it in. Sometimes I even say, tap your toes just a little bit, and you find that your mind and your heart actually reconnect a little bit. So I'm going to talk a little bit about trauma theory here. And I'm going to turn to Kathy Carruth. One of the things I love about Kathy Carruth is that she comes not out of science or psychology, but she comes out of comparative literature as did Freud when he began to talk about his own trauma theory back at the beginning of the 20th century. So she answers something of why we would take the time to attend to and re-metaphor difficult stories, histories, and realities. Her argument is that we need a variety of stories and metaphors to make sense of the traumatic. The traumatic is inherently unavailable for our understanding, unless it is re-experienced through story, art, the faces of other people. Through art, we stumble and feel our way back to reality. So Carruth turns to Freud as a basis for her theory. Freud talks about the double wound, that we cannot come to terms with reality until it is somehow reenacted before us, within us, around us. So Freud argues that there is a double side to the wound, not just that we experience it again, but there's a double side to the wound, and this is part of why it is un like traumatic events tend to be unavailable to our own experience unless we re-experience it. So one side of the wound protects us from the truth so that we might survive or continue on. The other side disorients us 
so that we might continue to seek out the truth or reenact the event, as foolish as that may sound. The wound cries out. The question for each person is, will the wound be witnessed by us once more, awakening us to reality? So in Carruth's mind, this is tenuous but necessary territory to venture for those who have been traumatized. For if we are going to survive, ultimately, isn't to ignore, but actually is to come to reality. And she argues this, if traumatic experience, as Freud indicates suggestively, is an experience that is not fully assimilated as it occurs, then these texts, whatever texts we actually encounter, each in its turn asks what it means to transmit and to theorize around a crisis that is marked, not by a simple knowledge, but by the ways it simultaneously defies and demands our witness. So this suggests that healing is not really an aim. You can't decide that you're going to be healed. Healing must lead to a process of reclamation for lost experience. Carruth points out that Freud returns often to the plight of the person who survives, and how often those who survive a crash or some other kind of traumatic event can rarely access their memory of what happened. Instead, they are left with the emptiness of surviving that which they have little access to knowing or understanding. So for Freud, this seems to be one of the great paradoxes of history and memory, that history shapes our understanding, but it does not often mirror reality fully. History becomes a means to access, access that which has been purposely forgotten or left behind, occluded, if you will. So to get to the history, however, we must be restoried and through through the faces, through the histories of others, and especially through the work of the artist. So this idea of discovering the true nature of one's own history through the history or narratives of others is both the most intriguing and the most confusing element of Carruth's overall argument. The indirectness of telling and the telling of sometimes the wrong story in the wrong place was core to her understanding of awakening to the real or awakening to that which has been forgotten, often purposefully. Mutual tellings and retellings cause us to hear outside of our understanding. To truly hear the story of another person is to embrace an unknowing of one's own story. To hear the story of someone else is to come home to our own selves. And artists do this better than anyone else. American artist Cary James Marshall is a great example. He invites his viewers to reconsider, reconsider how to see others, especially the African American community in the United States. Marshall discusses the erasure of black stories and faces within the history of art. Much of his worth, work plays with with making visible that which has been ignored or erased within our culture. To become erased is to lose dignity and value. And no surprise, I think that Erica's work is doing much the same thing. How to make visible that which is hidden or ignored within our own ecosystem, things that have been erased quite literally and we haven't noticed. So I think, that, I think artists are able to invite us into difficult stories and realities, enabling us to stay in the narrative longer if we feel shame or feel implicated by the sub subject matter. We as humans have a tendency to not see, ignore, occlude. The closer we get to shame, the more we cannot see. So our minds occlude the impact of difficult histories as if they were not really there. Art allows us to linger just a little bit longer and to acknowledge the shame and the reality. Art gives a capacity to allow the truth of the story to sink into us, to become part of us. As Marshall argues, how do you treat subjects of violence and brutality? Get people to look at it and then start to consider the implications of the things that is represented? It's, if, it's difficult to do with complexity because your emotional response to it is so raw, visceral, and simple. So his solution is often to actually occlude or hide certain elements so that we'll stay with the story longer and we'll actually allow, in some ways, the difficulty to move into us so that we can understand it on more complex levels. And back to Carruth. In opening 
the other's eyes, the awakening consists not in seeing, but in handing over the seeing. It does not and cannot contain to another and another future. So what is it that art does that allows art to help in this way? Art then is a way of trying to make sense of things. And artists like Carrie James Marshall are trying to figure out where it is they have landed and just what on earth is going on in the world. Trying to attend to the trauma that has shaped individual and collective experiences. Artists, after all, do not make art because they know something. They make art to figure things out. And I often say to my students, work in the interstices between your heart and where you've landed. Um, what arises is always most powerful when it is situated within a lived context. In other words, as well as being a form of expression, something that's commonly known, art is a form of understanding, a situated, sense-making, sense-trusting, active practice, a way to narrate lived experience, a way of paying attention, a way of coming to knowing through trusting unknowing. Mary Oliver's instructions for living a life pertain to everyone, not just artists. Pay attention. Be astonished. Tell about it. In developing a practice, artists are formed to pay attention in a particular way. To sum up all the practices of the studio, it is really ab all about honing one's ability to pay attention. Simone Weil thought attention was the pearl of great price. In McGilchrist believes that attention is not just receptive, but actually creative of the world we inhabit. How we attend makes all the difference to the world we experience. And and I, I are any of you familiar with Ian McGilchrist? In yeah, I see a few nods. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, so how to attend makes all the difference to the world we experience. How one pays attention can create and can destroy and has the power to alter what it meets. Whew, that's a pretty big claim. And we'll say more about this later. This, in short, is behind the power of the arts. Artists create images, experience sounds, that makes sense, that suddenly crystallize what we had no words for previously, that image the elephant in the room, remind what we have forgotten, reveal what was kept secret, that show the truth. Some call this creating new ontological tools. I call it metaphoring. Before we say more about the arts and watershed moments, let's turn now to our theme of thirst and water and lay some theological and material groundwork. We read in the first chapter of Genesis of the goodness of creation. Seven times this refrain is repeated, atmosphere, light, water, earth, vegetation, stars, creatures, and humans on the same day. All good. We are irrefutably good, irrefutably material, shaped from the soil, 70% water, infused with Yahweh's very breath. Bodies mostly of water, living on a watery planet. Um, this is Estrida Nemias, this quote. Blood, bile, intracellular fluid, a small ocean swallowed, a wild wetland in our gut, rivulets of forsaken, making, forsaken water making their way from our insides to our out, from watery room to watery world. We are bodies of water. Estrida goes on to remind us that we need other bodies of water to bathe us into being. I love that. Um, she goes on. Given the various interconnected and anthropogenically exacerbated water crises that our planet currently faces, and the list is again from, from drought and freshwater shortage to wild weather floods and other chronic contamination, this meaningful mattering of our bodies is also an urgent question of worldly survival. We are not separate from the salty oceanic waters. Still, our blood plasma 
amniotic fluid and tears share the same saturation of salt as the ocean. This insight initiated the project Saltwater Skin Boats that I'll show many of you uh, uh, tomorrow night. <clears throat> Bell Hooks writes, here I give you thunder. Shatter your hearts with rain. Let snow soothe you. Make your healing water clear, sweet. A sacred spring where the thirsty may drink. Animals all. Philosophers David Applebaum and Estrita Namayas both theorize the body is watery. Both see our relationship with water as key to addressing this watershed moment, to deepen our collective oneness with nature and perception of the essential. Like Thomas Berry, they call for us to rediscover intimacy with the earth. Drawing on wisdom gleaned from myth, science, and religion, we are watery bodies on a watery planet, and what we do with water matters. No surprise then that we have thirst and we need water. Um, from George MacDonald. <laughs> Let him who would know the love of the maker become sorely athirst and drink of that brook by the way, then lift up his heart, her heart, to the maker of oxygen and hydrogen, to the inventor and mediator of thirst and water, that humans might foresee a little of what their souls find in God. So if artists can return us to our sources for both life and faith, um, we might want to think theologically to kind of reconsider what a the theopoetics of water might be from a theological perspective. Um, yeah, I tend to be like one of those people, I'm like, I'm actually a theologian, so this is the thing that really concerns me. And the question is, why is it that our theology has led us here? We can't continue on in some ways with our same ways of thinking, yet at the same time, we don't have to imagine anew. We have to actually return to the original theopoetics. So this leads me to the themes of creation, baptism, recreation. In the Hebrew and Christian scriptures, water connects all three of these themes. Water, as we have discussed, is necessary for life. It is also integral for our spiritual health. So consistently in my experience, the two divergent kinds of spiritual stories we tell from scripture are either that one, creation is inherently good and part of God's good work in this world, or two, that creation is inherently problematic, bad, and requires redemption, and in the end, will be destroyed. This is the theology that I was raised with. Obviously, we think the first thing, that all of creation is good and, and created good and continues to be good. And, um, well, let's just start at the beginning before I start ad-libbing on something and say something problematic. Um, at the beginning of Genesis, we have the origins of all things with God's spirit, the Ruach Elohim, moving over the face of the water. I'll say, okay, I'll get myself in trouble a little bit. Um, often the eschatology especially, but some of the creation theology I was raised with almost separated God from the goodness of creation or problematized this story. And I never really understood this language that comes at the beginning of Genesis. I remember when I first taught biblical theology like 15 years ago when I first started teaching, I was like, this language is amazing. This God draws near to his creation. So the Ruach Elohim moves over the face of the waters. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the Tahom. And the Spirit of God, the Ruach Elohim, moved upon the Tahom. In a different translation, the Ruach Elohim hovers, calling forth life from the deep. This story tells us something particular about the creator and about creation. The world is created in intimacy, care, and love. But in the ancient Near Eastern context, most creation stories involve violence, death, and trauma. Um, in the Babylonian myth, 
one goddess is actually torn in two and the heavens are made from one part of her body and the earth is made from the other part and I'm like whoa um, so when you come to this story you see a God that actually cares comes face to face and it's this it's a uh, image of intimacy that the waters of the deep are met with the face of the Creator, and the Spirit of God hovers before every, anything is known. The idea of the to home or the depths of the world come from this passage. All of what we don't know or understand about the world that we are constantly scientifically trying to explain, the Spirit of God considered intimately, lovingly, before everything was even created. So the creator honors the material of creation and contemplates the process of creation like a sculpture uh, considers his own marble. In the Hebrew scriptures, um, the face represents the presence and the blessing of God. And so when we see in the second creation story in the second chapter of Genesis, you also see this image of God coming face to face with the soil this time and breathing into it. Walter Brueggemann talks about this as humanity being kissed into being. This kind of inti intimate kind of way how the nishmat hayim, the breath of life, goes into the soil and we become nefesh hayim, living beings, in this image of intimacy. So we see here and feel in both of these passages God's intimacy and care for the waters and for the earth. All that is created is, is declared good. The embodied sense of this goodness is God's face-to-faceness in the creation stories. This God draws close. The waters reveal and reflect this creation out of love. The earth reveals and reflects this creation out of intimacy. The creator draws close to the material of the world, does not despise it, and declares that it is good. So in the story of Christ's baptism that kind of mirrors this story of creation, the hovering spirit and the face of Christ are essential to how we understand the earthly minister, ministry of Jesus and the call toward recreation. We are invited into the process of recreation, not because we are defined by shame or brokenness, but because we are seen, known, and loved. To be loved by the God who draws near is to be called into our deepest personhood. So typical elements and depictions of Jesus' baptism are Jesus going to the desert to be baptized by John the Baptist and willingly entering the waters of the Jordan River. Jesus' body has a particular relationship with the water, and by entering into baptism, both affirms the goodness of all of creation and sacralizes all water as revelatory of the body of Christ. We hear the origins of the Christ hymn in Colossians chapter 1. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So the waters of Jordan become the first to reveal that it is, it is in and through Jesus' physical body that God will, quote, reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven. In this context, we can understand why the early Christian church, and even now in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, Jesus' baptism is, is celebrated alongside his birth on January 6th, which is why the Feast of Epiphany is the beginning of the church year and the Christmas season. This is more often known as the, the Feast of Theophany because of the revelation of Christ's divinity at this event. As Jesus is, is baptized, the Spirit hovers over him, similar to the Spirit's hovering over the waters of creation. The Father then proclaims, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Thus the water becomes a vehicle of revelation, and Jesus is anointed into his ministry on earth. In, his theopoetics, in this theopoetics of water, the baptism of Christ becomes the source or the watershed of the recreations of the world. The waters of recreation flow from the Father and the Spirit through Christ and baptize the world. In this theophany icon, we see John baptizing Jesus in the Jordan River. The Spirit is a dove descending and hovering, John and others listening to the words of the Father, and Christ standing over the chaos or the deeps of the water. Again, a reference to the creation story. 
The one through whom all things were made enters into the created world, draws close so that all things might participate in the reconciling of all things and persons and have a fullness of life and relationship with the creator. Christ is baptized in the Jordan and all things are baptized in Jesus. Which leads us to the waters of recreation. And again, I don't think it's a mistake that at the end of, of the Christian scriptures, we see again a, a, a mirroring of what we see in the book of, of Genesis at the beginning, the, the spirit hovering over the, the, the tree of life actually coming to life. So we see an image of the tree of life here from Revelation 22, similar to the baptismal scene. We notice the spirit as a dove providing the waters of renewal. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. And here we kind of see here, um, I love this little bit. We don't have time to talk about the river gods and all the things that are being um, inco incorporated into this, but we see a little phoenix here that represents um, redemption and resurrection. We see the River Jordan personified here as one of the river gods, and this dude is just, um, he's having a good time. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, this is heaven. Um, so in some ways, we kind of see the waters flowing out through the tree of life, renewing all of the world. The, the leaves of this tree are for the healing of all the nations. God honoring all of creation. And I don't think it's a mistake that Jacques Ellul often talked about this as the city garden, the rede redeeming of all of human culture and the renewal of all of creation. So in, in all of this, imagination, song, iconography, poetry, art, the sacred stories are all ways of knowing or ways of attending that help us make sense of our lived experiences. And each of these ways to wisdom, we might call them, are marginalized within contemporary society. Psychiatrist, neuroscientist, polymath Ian McGilchrist brings together neurology, physics, and philosophy to call for another way of knowing, way of attending, to shape society. His work challenges the common assumption that the world is essentially mechanical and inert, nothing but a collection of things to use. The mechanistic paradigm remains our society's primary way of understanding the world, and it remains essential. It is just that in isolation, it is insufficient. It needs to be nested within a second way of paying attention. So, um, um, Ian McGilchrist wrote The Master and His Emissary, The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World. His massive two-volume, The Matter with Things, Our Brains, Our Delusions, and the Unmaking of the World is his newly published two-volume tome. Literally, it's like that, and The Master and His Emissary is like that. Um, in meticulous detail, backed up with extensive brain research for every point, McGill Christ describes how our brain functions. Divided into two halves, connected by the corpus callosum, the brain is a single, integrated, highly dynamic system of networks. The whole brain is used for everything. However, each hemisphere pays attention in entirely different ways. It's not that you do things at different parts of your brain. It ends up that your whole brain is used for everything, but your hemispheres pay attention in entirely different ways. Um, the brain's left hemisphere is designed to help us apprehend and thus manipulate the world. The right hemisphere is designed to help us comprehend, see it for what it is. To manipulate is not to understand, however, and this is the important point. The ability to simplify things in order to use them mitigates against understanding the fullness and complexity, the reality of things. Power, which is basically ability without understanding, blinds. It can wreak havoc precisely because it does not understand. So it's dangerous. It can use, it can manipulate and use. It doesn't understand, 
therefore it can wreak havoc. From the foreword, this book argues that we are wrecking havoc on ourselves and the world and that if our, and, and that if our best, and that, despite our best intentions, leads to paradoxical outcomes, it is precisely because we have been mesmerized by the mechanistic, reductionist way of thinking, the product of a brain system which evolved not to help us understand, but merely to manipulate the world, that of the left hemisphere. We have become blind to what the subtler, more intelligent, and more perceptive right hemisphere sees. Consequently, we no longer seem to have the faintest idea who we are, what the world is, or how we relate to it. And so, therefore, it should be no surprise to anyone here that all of the arts, poetry, and an apprehension of the sacred are all outcomes that rely heavily on what McGilchrist calls right hemisphere attention. So, in the studio, what we do is exercise right hemisphere attention. We hone it. We also use left hemisphere, but we do actually exercise and teach cognitive tools that, that end up aligning almost perfectly with what McGilchrist des describes as right hemisphere attention. So here we go, hemisphere characteristics. The left hemisphere excels in highly focused, deep silos of selective attention local, narrow, analytical, mechanical, linear attention. The right is broad, global, flexible, open and curious, keen to learn without preconditions what exists. The left and the right, I remind you, are both necessary. The left prioritizes what is already known and has a hard time with change. The right is comfortable with what is not known. It is a huge capacity for ambiguity, tolerance, and flexibility of thought, two things that we develop in the studio. The left is interested in instrumental use, the right in understanding. The left prioritizes predictable routine, the right, the new, exploratory, intuitive. The left understands how to manipulate, interrogate, dissect, loves tools, whereas the right sees the whole complex interrelated gestalt. Empathy, compassion, are cultivated with the right hemisphere. Calculated probabilities are cultivated with the left hemisphere. Both entirely necessary. The hemispheres need each other and ideally nest together, passing information back and forth across the corpus callosum at least twice. McGilchrist accesses a mountain of neurological research to back up each assertion, citing exactly what happens when one hemisphere does not function, and it's not pretty. <laughs> Neither on its own functions successfully. Fair to say we do an excellent job in cultivating the left hemisphere in our society and educational institutions, not so much with the right. McGilchrist says, I argue that the reductionist paradigm has had a good run for its money, but the time is over. We need a new one. As a way of demonstrating right hemisphere attention, take a look at the grayscale on the screen. Take a look at the top dot and take a look at the bottom dot and compare the two and then describe what you see. And I, I won't ask you to call out even though I'm sure you could and there's lots of rave souls who would. Um, um, most people um, observe that the top one is dark and the bottom one is light. But in fact, they're the very same value. What has changed is the ground, the context, the relationship between the, the circle and the surrounding square. This used to be used to demonstrate that, that perception, senses, our perceptual apparatus was untrustable, was and we became suspicious of our senses and our perception. And Descartes' work is all built upon that, that our senses cannot be trusted. However, it's not the problem, isn't it, with our senses. The problem is with taking data out of its context because everything is relational, as we've heard in the, in, in the, in the beginning. Everything is relational. You take that dot out of its context, and, and you change it because we see relationally, just like we now know the trees um, are relational because of their mycorrhizal connections underground. 
So, so in fact, seeing value in color is context determined. Is context determined? There's no truth without context. Tone appears to shift when surrounded by a different tone ground. The dark ground drains the dark, the white drains the light. Another thing we teach in the studio is negative space. This in-betweenness is called negative space, and I often say that off, um, artists make in the interstices between us, our hearts, and where we've landed, as, I, as I've mentioned before. But uh, on Saturday, we'll be doing some drawing exercises, and we'll be, ex we'll be exercising the right hemispheres of our brains. And of course, the artists in the, in the crowd already know this, and, and will be familiar with contours and gestures and negative space studies and all those you know, familiar things that we do in, in, in first year studio studies. Okay, so context is really huge. And why? Because it's relational. It's relational. The context, object, figure, ground, relationship in the context is a relationship. Um, okay, anyway, more about that throughout the conference. But this is the kind of thing that I've named as an apophatic epistemology. So apophatic from the Christian tradition, meaning, the, meaning everything that we don't know the cataphatic is everything we do know. And so these are the two big traditions within, within the Christian uh, tradition. So understanding the implications, so back to the climate crisis, understanding the implications of being a planetary geophysical force requires a change, a change in hemisphere attention, a radical reimagination of humanity's place in the whole scheme of things, what I call, or besides an apophatic epistemology, a canonic term, if I can borrow from, from a theological word, kenosis, a canonic term. Thomas Berry held that reclaiming intimacy with the earth was the great work of this age. And one of the roles of the artist is to ask questions, and there are, of course, plenty here to ask. But what the artists are doing that, that, that is available to all of us to do is actively condense, crystallize, extend into unknowing, inhabit our right hemisphere in order to make sense of things, to, to pass the data back and forth over the corpus callosum in order to see the gestalt, not just the data, not just the little picture, not just our own silos, but we can then begin to see the gestalt. That's what we need to do. Um, so extending into unknowing in order to make sense of things. Artists enact an ap apophatic epistemology of sort in order for something new to emerge. Um, and um, uh, the theorist Morton identifies actually whether conversations as symptomatic as an ontological shift in human awareness, uh, requiring an equally profound ontological upgrade, adding that it's very much the job of philosophers and other humanity scholars, basically all of us, um, to attune ourselves to the upgrading process and to help explain it. As vital as it is to measure the health of the planet with science, it is equally vital to reimagine and visualize our relations with it using art. Art making is necessary. McGilchrist's work invites a kind of revolution of attention for our entire globe, parallel to how Descartes' insight fueled world-changing outcomes. This new revolution, one of care and compassion, empathy for the environment, for ecology, brings balance, harnesses attention in order to avert the crisis of inattention. And we're, we're getting to the end. Um, I want to share, well, I won't talk very much about this, but I already showed you this image before. But I feel like this brings in many ways all the things we've been talking to, probably in a very apophatic sort of way. I see this as an inherently baptismal sort of image. Um, I do see this as kind of an incarnational, Jesus in the middle, everything flowing through Christ. You know, Christ entering into the creation to bring about a point of redemption. Um, and I just want to maybe share, oh, I know. There's too many things to do. Um, mm -mm. 
I'll tell one story of renewal, and I bet you there's a bunch of Arosha people. Have, has everyone heard of Arosha here? Kind of, yeah, Arosha crowd, thank you very much. Um, so what difference does all of this make, in a sense? If in some ways we as, as Christians, those of us who identify as Christians, people who are spiritual people, if the creator of all things really draws near to creation at the very beginning, and maybe in some ways this is the ethic at which we are being called to attend to, to reconsider, to rethink, um, I thought I'd give a very practical example of a single curve in the Duwamish River. What happens when a single curve changes in a river? And so you can see up in, on, in the newer kind of image, that little red dot, that's just kind of one really, really small, there's a park there now. And they decided instead of to actually destroy this little um, island that's there, they were gonna create, oh, I, I think they were gonna put something there, like a, a station to, load things on and instead activists kind of came along and said well what if we preserved this and bj cummings the first time she ever rode her kayak on the duwamish river she's going down all the industrial things she turns the corner and she goes turning that corner was a revelation and as she turned the corner from this very industrial river she said, a concave wall of ash fine sand rose from the water on my left, binding together a layer of ancient clamshells still visible in the eroded blank bank. Belted kingfishers trilled as they skipped from tree to tree ahead of my boat, and a great blue heron skimmed low, flushed from reeds on my right. Ahead, a mud flat extended around the bend, alive with speckled shorebirds scurrying along the water's edge. I felt I had passed into another time, one before barges and smokestacks and sewer grates. The serene meander we found ourselves paddling along in our kayaks and its sudden proliferation of wildlife was a revelation. So maybe st ending on a bit of a what if? What if we drew close? What if we changed our attention? What if? And imagine a new ending. So, <clears throat> Thomas Berry used the aspirational term ecozoic to put aside the anthropocentric anthropocentric in favor of biocentric norms of progress. He envisioned a society where every aspect of life, economics, education, science is subordinate to ecology or we will not survive. Learning intimacy with the earth was, as I said earlier, what he said, the great work of our age. It is time to wake up and repair the occluded watershed. Art can help. By exercising right hemisphere attention, we all can develop the preconditions for empathy and compassion, send the otherwise ego-driven self out, cultivate ambiguity, tolerance, fluidity of imagination, flexible purposing. By learning right hemisphere attention, we can see the gestalt, draw on the generative power of opposites, tacit knowledge, trust the intuition, scrutinize emotions, pay attention to sensory perception, lean into chaos. an emergent, active practice through which we come to our senses. Art making synthesizes new ideas and forges connections between disciplines. Get the left and the right working together, then we can help restore the trauma till we get to the truth. Listen more clearly to what water teaches, remember the metaphors, recognize the patterns, choose to walk in a good way on the land and with one another. And so, Above all right now, we need to the collective courage to stop, change course, and imagine a new way forward. Perhaps it is an old way. Can we extend and green our subjectivities, create new ontological tools? Remember we are watery bodies on a watery planet in one system, waking up in the sixth extinction. Can we imagine a new ending? Borrowing from the last line of Dante's Inferno, 
can we find a way out of the inferno and still see stars? Everyone who is thirsty, come. The river of the water of life, bright as crystal, is waiting. It is here for those who have ears to hear and eyes to see. Thank you very much. <laughs>